yesterday, I went to Google Suneko Okazaki, this amazing um, molecular biologist, and look how it's, she's described, Riji Okazaki's wife. So Riji Okazaki it was her husband, um, who was, and he's described as a Japanese molecular biologist. And the thing is, the two of them worked together to make these incredible discoveries about DNA replication, so how DNA is copied. And so basically there's this puzzle that like, DNA has two strands that are, um, they can only get, each strand can only get copied in one direction and the strands are in opposite directions. So one of the strands that called the lacking strand has to be made in these um, short pieces called the Okazaki fragments. Well, we know that because of their work, their work, not just his work, their work. Um, and so at the time, Suneko Okazaki was actually like this um, barrier breaker for w women. So this is like especially fr infuriating for me that she's described this way. So at the time in Japan, um, women couldn't really be like seen as researchers. And so she was described as like being in his lab, but they were working together. And after she, he died, um, she actually carried on the work and she made even further discoveries, including discovering the RNA primers I'll tell you about, which actually um, like are the start pieces for those Okazaki fragments. Um, so everyone like expected her to stop researching um, after his death. Um, especially because she had two young kids, but she kept going um, and some neighbor friends helped with um, the childcare and she has since, she's been an advocate for women and women's rights and female researchers. Um, she and students, she paid like for one of her, for a graduate student who couldn't afford the education. Um, so in addition to all of this amazing um, science she's done, She's done this incredible work um, to support women and underrepresented people in sciences. And it's just so infuriating to me that this is how Google is showing people um, who she is. Um, and so today I want to tell you a little more about the work that she did um, with her husband. Um, and hopefully now when you hear Okazaki fragments, you will think of both of them and not just him because they did the work together. Um, and yeah, and I will also um, point you to some links where you can learn more. Um, also be going over these a uh, couple of the key papers. So there's six couple of papers published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS, in 1967 and 1968. There are a few th key things I want you to keep in mind in our talk about DNA. So DNA is like the source of genetic information, and so if a cell wants to copy itself, so make another copy, it has to, in this process called replication, it has to copy all of its DNA so that when it splits in two, each daughter cell is going to get a copy. And it can do this because DNA, well for a number of reasons, but one of them is that DNA is typically like double-stranded and it has this thing called base pair complementarity where you can have, um, so there are four DNA letters, A, C, T, and G, and DNA is just like a string of these letters, um, these deoxynucleotides. And um, you have this specific base pairing where A pairs just with T and G pairs just with C. So if you have one strand, you know the sequence of the other strand and you can make a copy of the one strand based on the other strand. So you can have like double-stranded DNA, you unzip it, um, then you make a copy and now you have uh, str one strand, the strand that the other strand um, using that initial strand as a copy and now you have two copies. Um, and but this copying requires help um, from proteins called enzymes which are like reaction speeder upper helpers. Um, and so like a couple of one of the en main en the en enzyme that'll do this is called the um, DNA dependent DNA polymerase. Um, sometimes just called like DNA polymerase. And so it'll use one copy as a template and help piece together the pieces. Um, and the, piece, the piecing together happens in these phosphodiester bonds um, that involve using the phosphate groups. So this like um, these high energy, um, parts where you have this phosphorus connected by these oxygens and you have this negative charge that's kind of like a clamp spring and so it's like energy waiting to be used. And then at the other end you have an OH group, um, so a hydroxyl group 
um, that you can join on to an incoming base and then spend that ATP, um, spend that um, phosphate group to um, catalyze, so to pay for the bond forming. So we have this, when you have base, when you have DNA is double-stranded DNA, the strands are anti-parallel. So you have a five prime end on one, like going one direction on, like one strand has a five prime end on like the left or whatever, and then the other strand has a five prime end on the right or whatever. So, and the DNA copiers can only copy from five prime to three prime. So, because the incoming base is actually going to pay for joining the bond. So the incoming base to be added is um, bringing that three phosphate, bringing those phosphate groups to pay for the polymerization. So this is why you go from like five prime ends to three prime ends. So a DNA polymerase can do this. It takes that three and it makes this, um, this bond. Um, so if you want to connect from the other end, you need a different protein enzyme, so a different reaction helper to help. So a molecule called DNA ligase can do this. So it can join gaps. Um, it can join like gap chains and that sort of thing. But it can't, um, it can't like make DNA copies. Like it's not helping with like making copies. It's just like fixing gaps. Um, so when you, and this comes into play when you have DNA copying because you're going to have these gaps. So if you want to copy DNA, there are a few challenges. So we have this like double-stranded DNA, right? And so, well, one problem is pretty obvious. The strands are struck together, so you need to unzip it. Um, so there's a protein called, a, d proteins called DNA helicases, which um, like lead the way and they unstrand, bind the strands ahead of the polymerases. And so it's doing that when it does this, it creates this like replication fork. So if you were thinking of the zipper, when you're unzippering it, like where the zipper the zip, what do you call that? I don't know what you call that, like the part you pull on. That's gonna be like your fork where you have that split occurring. Um, and so that's gonna take care of the unzipping. But now we see that we have those strands going in opposite directions and we can only um, copy in one direction. And this is where the Okazaki fragments are going to come in. Um, and so the one strand, the, the leading strand is going to be continuously synthesized, so you get this one long strand, and the Okazaki fragments are going to be these like shorter strands that are formed. Um, so in order to form those, however, you need to have a starting, like a start point. And so just kind of like in PCR, you might remember we talked about, um, you have you use these short pieces of DNA called primers to specify where DNA polymer or like where the polymerase will start. Um, copying and it turns out that um, so Sunako actually discovered these RNA primers so basically this the start point so instead of like DNA primers being laid down these like short RNA primers are laid down and so those are going to be removed later but so this is because like a polymerase needs to know where to start um, and so you give it this piece to start off of and so it's, you're going to give it this like RNA primer so using a DNA to RNA polymerase so and then the DNA to DNA polymerase can take over and make the copies. Um, so from the leading strand perspective you have um, the fork progressing more with the help of the helicase and more DNA is opening, a copy. It's opening up in front of it so it can travel on it and copy um, and so it does this and you get continuous replication. But from the lacking strand perspective, so from that other strand, it's copying, but the, the zipper is unzipping the other direction, and so it's getting like further away from the point. So it has to come back. Um, it has to like go back and fill in the gaps, and so you get these discontinuous replication. And these fragments are called Okazaki fragments um, uh, because they were discovered by the Okazakis. Um, and so we, now we know more about this. Um, I'll tell you more about how they discovered it in a minute, but we know now what we know is that, um, so that's not the end, remember, we still have those RNA primers. Um, so now you have this, um, another enzyme called a five prime to three prime exonuclease that's going to chew from the five prime to the three prime. It's going to chew off that RNA bit. Um, so you get rid of the RNA, but now you have gaps in your DNA. Um, so the DNA polymerase comes and it fills in those gaps. So that's good, but we now we have um, 
a five prime monophosphate. When we chewed it off, now we don't have those three phosphate groups acting as like that plant spring to provide the energy. Um, and so now we need a different enzyme to help. And so this is where the DNA ligase is going to come in and fill it in the gap and um, seal that gap that was filled in. So, how did they find this out? Um, so we're gonna a little background you need is um, so there's this thing called. Um, this idea of like a radioactive isotope. So elements, so things like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, those are um, elements and they're made up of units, called, they're common units of atoms. Um, so like if you were to order an oxygen, that'd be an atom, we'd be like an atom of oxygen. It's like the smallest like part that's still that thing. Um, but within that thing are smaller parts. Um, and so at the core there's this nucleus where you have these protons which are positively charged and these neutrons which are neutral and yet this is like this dense central core but then all around it are, is this electron cloud which has these negatively charged electrons and so the electrons are usually what gets all the attention because they're the ones that are gonna um, drive interaction so like for example that in our phosphates that's what's the the ne negative charge is coming from it's like this imbalance of electrons and protons so it has this negative charge and then that makes it really reactive and stuff but this, um, so the neutrons typically don't get that much attention because they're like these neutral things that um, it's like, well, why should we care about them? Well, it turns out that different elements can actually have different numbers of neutrons. Like the same, different atoms of the same element can have different numbers of neutrons. We call these um, iso nuclear isotopes. So sometimes this doesn't really affect anything, but sometimes this can make an atom radioactive. So basically it has like too many or too few neutrons and that makes the nucleus uncomfy. And then it can uh, make itself more comfy by releasing radiation. Um, and so it's like releases an energetic particle um, that then can be detected. So they're gonna make use of this using a radioactive um, version of, um, so this like radioactive version of DTPP. So the T letter, DNA letter T, but made radioactive um, with this, so it's deoxythymidine. And what they're gonna do is a pulse chase experiment. Um, and so basically a pulse chase is when you do something and then you kind of like follow up. Um, so what they're going to do is they're going to give the, they take bacteria and they want this to, so in order, they're trying to like get a look at DNA copying in real, kind of in real time, but not really in real time. But they want to see what, how this DNA copying is happening. And so you might think that bacteria copy pretty fast, but they want something even faster. And so they use like this T4 phage. So a phage is a, or a bacteria phage is a virus that infects bacteria. And they copy like crazy in bacteria. Um, so they get the bacteria to make lots and lots of copies of phage. Um, so the Okazakis could infect bacteria with the phage and then um, know that the bacteria would make a lot, a lot of DNA. And so that would be really helpful for them to be able to study this. Um, and so what they're doing is they're using a pulse of radioactivity. This, so they add this radioactive DTTP um, just for a short time, like 20 seconds. So the DNA that's made during that pulse time would be radio labeled. And then they would do a cold chase. So sometimes we call radioactive things like hot. Um, and then non-radioactive stuff would be cold. So they do this hot chase, this hot pulse, and then they're going to do this cold chase. So they chase it with normal DTTP. And so now any, uh, the strands can still get longer, but they're gonna, that, what the longer stuff is gonna be non-radioactive. Um, so at longer time periods, the labeled leading strand will get longer, but the lagging strand labeled piece will stay short um, for a while, but then it's gonna get ligated to the piece behind it and it'll get long. So then they'll be like, look the same. Um, and so now they needed a way to be able to like separate the different pieces. Um, so what they did is they did, um, they separated the strands using um, NaOH to raise the pH and disrupt the strand to strand base pairing. So that like A to T, um, G to C stuff, they um, disrupt that so the strands come apart but the strands stay strands. Um, and they do like a few different time points. So without a chase, with a 30 minute chase, with a 60 minute chase. And then they want to visualize how, like what 
what size the fragments are that the radioactivity is in. And so we do this using a sucrose gradient, a sucrose density gradient. Um, so sucrose is the sugar, and so basically they have this like really thick sugar watery solution -y type thing. And they put the pieces in it and then they spin it down. Um, and then the longer pieces are going to travel further down because they're like the heavier things are going to sink further quicker um, and so then they could see where the radioactivity um, ends up and so this is show that this chart is in like volume from top and so the closer to the top would be like the further to the left um, so you can see that so they grew the bacteria with that um, oh yeah so just for reference this like black thing it's that's just the bacterial genome um, that, so they grew the bacteria with um, C14 labeled dimidine before the pulse so a different form of radioactive thing so then they could um, compare the bacterial DNA for them um, that was background um, okay so now you can see up the it's like towards this top so in the, the smaller pieces you see when they're looking at this this signal from the tritium, so from that DTTP that they put in, you see these like short pieces are made, um, and then these short pieces disappear um, with the longer pulse so when they these strands are getting joined together to the further um, to those pieces that were behind it. Um, but how could they show that this was actually like not just a bunch of little pieces? It, it wasn't just like the strand, those were just starting strands or that sort of thing. So now they needed um, to turn to some help from a mutant because so the problem is like the ligase is like stitching them together so fast it's hard to see. Um, so they use this um, a temperature sensitive DNA, um, so temperature sensitive um, Stage that has this like temperature sensitive ligase and so that ligase is that joiner and so um, they took this um, so that this mutation makes it so that it acts normal at a low temperature but if it can't stitch well if you raise the temperature so now they could like compare it um, like kind of like a normal version to a non-normal version by switching the temperature um, and this is important because they needed that like if you couldn't like they wouldn't be able to grow and thrive um, if you weren't able to make them normal for a little bit by changing the temperature. Um, but by then deactivating the ligase type, um, like raising the temperature so the ligase isn't very useful anymore, then you can capture those smaller pieces before they can get joined. Um, so you can see so the wild type, so the normal, the non mutant version is here. You can see you can like barely see these fragments even at a short time period and then they totally disappear. Um, but with this temperature sensitive mutant, um, they you can see that these Kozaki fragments form and they stay um, formed even over time. So this is showing that these Okazaki fragments are indeed um, forming and now they can't be ligated together. They stick around and you can detect them. Uh, you know, I have a blog version of this, um, so if you want a lot more detail, um, you can find it there. Um, and I encourage you to check out a couple of articles by Zuneko um, and an interview with her um, that are really good, and I'll have links to them in the text.